Oh, good afternoon, everyone, and I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today about uh, pest ecology and the risks to pasture resilience in the climate change scenario. I'd particularly like to acknowledge my co-authors uh, and Sue Zeidenbos for giving me the opportunity to uh, work on this. And let's see if I've got the buttons right. Excellent. So when we sat down to think about this topic, one of the first things I and my co-authors realized was that there is very, very sparse data on the impacts of climate change on New Zealand pasture pests. There are no system level studies and probably only at most a handful of studies of individual pests. So rather than try to review the very tiny amount of literature, what we decided to do was to look at the international literature and identify potential pest responses to climate change and then select case studies of New Zealand pests that could potentially show these responses. So we're effectively inferring potential climate change impacts. Our first one is a pest that many in this audience will be very familiar with, which is black beetle. And this is a pest that is already clearly responding to climate change. In the map here, you will see the black shaded area reflects the um, predicted distribution historically from uh, leading up to 2000, with the yellow circles marking the actual known current records. The worrying part is to look at that gray shaded fill. That is the climate projection, if you're looking at sort of a, from about 2040 to 2060, and you can see a substantial range expansion predicted for this pest, which responds to warm temperatures. And that includes the South Island, where it is not currently present. Building on that, someone um, earlier today, in fact, I think it was John Caradis, mentioned sleeper pests. We have a group of sleeper pests in New Zealand, the earth mites, which are major pests in the Australian climates already. Red-legged earth mite, based on Australian climate change prediction, uh, sorry, projections, should expand its range onto the east coast of both islands and become a more significant pest than it is now. The other interesting one are the blue oat mites. These are actually a group of species not just one, and each of these species has its own climate predictions and climate potential climate responses. If we want to make predictions for New Zealand, we actually need to identify which pests we have where first, and then we can potentially draw on Australian data to make predictions. Another interesting aspect of climate change, and people again have talked about it, is the potential for greater extremes of climate. And for some pests, those extreme events may actually be highly favorable. The example here is a little known exotic weevil, Flora's weevil. And you can see if you look at the dashed lines, which are marking um, periods of drought, measured as soil moisture deficit. And you can see there's a peak in the pest numbers, the dark line, following closely after peaks in soil moisture deficit. So for this pest, it likes drought and it responds to it. So you can potentially have a challenge where New pests will have unexpected outbreaks, and they may be harder to predict. There's even more possibilities with climate change. And for those pests that have multiple generations in a year, as it gets warmer, they can actually squeeze more generations in over that time. So this, uh, to explain this graph, if you imagine looking along the x-axis, uh, at the lower end, you're thinking about the lower South Island, and you're gradually traveling north as you go up the x-axis to give you an idea of the number of generations per year that happen with diamondback moth. So diamondback moth is another warm adapted species that likes it when it gets warmer. The lighter blue shade represents 2020 expected generations. The darker color is the overlap between the projections. And what you want to look at is the lighter orangey shade for 2070. Effectively, this insect will increase its number of generations by one. Wherever it is, it'll add one generation in New Zealand. It might not sound like much, but remember that extra generation means another increase in abundance over that seasonal cycle. It also means they'll arrive earlier in the crop. So particularly for those down south that might have not dealt with this pest as much, it could become noticeably more damaging. So these are all implications around the climate aspect of climate change. Insects will actually respond to the elevated CO2 as well, not just the climate-related changes. 
and that response will be mediated by the plant's response to enhance CO2. This is one where we really don't know much, much at all in New Zealand, but we do have a little bit of data drawn from an experiment that used the uh, FACE experiment, the enhanced CO2 experiment that Ag Research runs. So what happened is Perina in the lab were fed ryegrass that was either grown under normal conditions or grown under enhanced CO2, and they're also kept in soil that was either under normal conditions or under enhanced CO2. And it was set up in a factorial experiment. So the one we expected is the red bar, and that is where they were fed ryegrass tillers under elevated CO2, but were living in normal soil. And when they were fed those um, ryegrass tillers, there was a reduction in growth rate. And that's because plant, plant quality reduces under enhanced CO2. There's a shift in the nitrogen ratio, and the insects don't get as good nutrition. But when they were fed ryegrass tillers under, grown under ambient conditions, but reared in soil under elevated CO2, there was an unexpected increase in weight gain. That's the green bar. We have no idea why. That's just the result we got. Uh, and the, when, but when we put those two things together, effectively the plus and the minus seem to cancel each other out. So if, they're reared, if they have tillers that are reared under elevated CO2 and soil under elevated CO2, there was no difference compared with ambient conditions. That's just scratching the surface of some of the complications around this part of the response to climate change. The last point I want to make, and there's been a lot of discussion around system changes, and quite a few people talking about plantain and some of the benefits of growing plantain. As far as some native insects were concerned, growing plantain was actually quite a bit good benefit for them because it provided them with an all-you-can-eat buffet, and they moved onto it and exploded in population numbers. And they caused substantial damage to this new forage crop. This is not to say that you should uh, be, you know, not be experimenting with new forage crops, but we need to be aware that if you change the types of food available, insects may colonize that new food source. And this is a good example of that. So what does this mean in terms of how we work with climate change? Climate change will act on all aspects of the pasture, not just the livestock, not just your pasture plants, it'll act on the pests, it'll actually act on the natural enemies of the pests, and I haven't touched on that today. There are multiple interlinked responses by pests to climate change in terms of both temperature and CO2. We have gaps in our knowledge of pest biology which are being exposed and they're hindering our ability to make predictions and we can expect the unexpected under climate change. I also haven't touched on the fact that new pests will arrive with climate change. But I and my colleagues agree that resilience is possible if we invest in knowledge now. Forewarned will be forearmed when it comes to pests under climate change. And I'd just like to acknowledge the many discussions and uh, various funding bodies that supported our work that we presented. Thank you.